week on the Hockey IQ podcast, we bring on Michael Toplitsky. Mike is a good friend of mine from the Cleveland area. He's uh, coached out there for quite some time now, and he's just got a wealth of knowledge and a great viewpoint on coaching, not only for the skills, uh, but for the holistic player. So it's a lot of fun to see how his mindset has shifted through the years um, and how he's approached different situations. Uh, he came into uh, what many would probably call a difficult situation on uh, giving back to the local youth organization, even though he was coaching a high school team and had been for quite some time. And we really dive into that on this episode and a lot of, a lot of good points here. I'm really excited to share this episode with everyone. So let's get into it. On this episode of the Hockey IQ podcast, we bring on my good friend, Michael Toplitsky. Uh, Michael is a dang good coach, uh, but had a, a very interesting situation when he was volunteering uh, back into the youth ranks from being a high school coach. So uh, excited to dive into that plus more. So Mike, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, maybe give a little bit of uh, coaching background uh, and how you approach the game. And I guess I I'd more focus on how you approach coaching the team, ensuring everyone's got a role and feels included. Uh, Cause you do come from a background um, of working uh, in the schools. Yep. So my, uh, my experience with hockey started, you know, obviously with playing youth hockey and, and playing high school hockey. And then uh, kind of during my, my, you know, getting my, my master's in education, I, I happened to find an opportunity to get into coaching at uh, a, a local high school at, at kind of a, one of the teams that's, you know, the, the focus of the program is going to be, you know, sustaining numbers, uh, teaching development, um, you know, more so than, you know, competing for, for state championships, but absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, worked in that assistant uh, assistant coaching position for four years and then uh, ended up taking over a, a local high school program um, in, in, in kind of that same area uh, where the focus is, is really going to be on development and, you know, sustaining a program and kind of creating a culture uh, where those three things are going to be more prevalent than, you know, going for state titles, still wanting to, you know, win championships and, and, you know, collect some tournament trophies, but where there's a bit different emphasis. So that's where the, uh, the, the, you know, where I kind of fall on the coaching tree. Philosophy of coaching is uh, similar to, you know, how a lot of, a lot of companies try to try to run their business. You fill the bus with good people and then you figure out where they sit. You figure out how to, how to put the right person in the right seat to get the bus moving in the right direction. So, uh, really strong emphasis in, in all the teams I've been with of making sure that uh, everyone kind of understands their role, whether it's uh, leading all the stats categories and, you know, all the way to developing skills in areas A, B, and C uh, to be able to contribute more to the team, you know, down the road than immediate. I mean, it, it, it all depends on the situation, but that's kind of the the road I took and the the philosophy that that I've kind of established there. Yeah, and that's awesome. And even with your playing background, I, I think that you more than most understand the value of finding a role and figuring out a place on a team. Uh, I would say that you you outshone your talents and scored a lot more goals uh, because you hang around the net and you're just this feisty little nutcracker. So was your playing career and, and maybe not being the the point getter. Uh, really help you understand with a lot of these kids that are further back in the lineup or just, you know, trying to stay in that lineup or trying to get some ice time or increase their ice time, like truly understand on, on that personal level. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, on, unlike uh, the hockey, I know I've seen you play. Um, I, I wasn't usually walking anybody. So um, uh, I was, I was usually the, the smallest guy on the ice and may not have had as much youth experience as, as other guys I was playing with. So uh, I, I had to make up for it in 110% effort at all times, A, to show the coach that I belonged on the ice, and B, you know, to get to the, the quiet area behind the net or to get to the slot. And 
you know, do the hard work to get those ugly goals. It, it's, it's been tough for me and, you know, it's tough for everyone at the high school level in particular, in particular to, to try to get, uh, get the kids to understand that, a you know, a snipe off the crossbar and in counts the same as, you know, a, a nasty, dirty goal off the fifth rebound where you're in the right position and you lower the bottom hand and bend your knees and, and put in a, a scrappy rebound. They all count the same. So I'll, I'll take 20 of those over five bar downs. I mean, I feel like that's something that a lot of players struggle to understand. And even um, some parents would struggle to understand is, you know, my, my kid's so good. Well, coaching isn't always about putting the best good players out there, putting the good kids out there. It's about putting the right players out there for whatever the situation calls for. And most importantly, who's going to be the most effective? Uh, like for, for me, I, when I watch uh, any NHL game, you know, it's all about who's effective. Like you can be the flashiest player ever, but it doesn't matter unless you put that puck in the back of the net or you're driving the play forward or you're blocking a shot or doing something that's going to be effective for your team's performance and leading to winning. It's not all about how good you are, how skilled you are, but how much you contribute. Yeah, I think uh... – you and I have, have discussed this in the past, a concept that I that I like, and it's uh, – I don't know that a lot of coaches would love this because it's not a, a measurable analytic per se, but I'm a big fan of the net positive. So the best player on a high school team a lot of times has been the best player on their Bantam and Pee Wee and Squirt team and, uh, you know, may have, may have had a lot of coaches that were dads of players on the teams who would say – uh, we're going to win if we get the puck to Joe. Let's just keep getting it to Joe. Joe, you go coast to coast and do what you got to do. Well, if Joe can't pass and play within a system and Joe won't block shots or back check and Joe takes eight penalty minutes a game but scores two goals and you lose six to two every game, you know, Joe, is Joe bringing a net positive or is Joe just a really good, you know, standalone hockey player? You'll, you'll win a lot of games in Bantam that way, but you get to the high school level, and especially at higher levels of high school play. And I'm sure, you know, it, it uh, you know, the college ranks that you've seen, flashiest best player on the ice can only do so much in a game, particularly if they're not on the ice because their coach can't trust them to not, you know, not be in the box all game or, you know, they won't, they won't do the, the less flashy things. A uh, perfect example, I, I think, was, was rookie year, only two or three years in, is Ovechkin in a one goal game. Uh, was sitting on the bench because his team was leading. And I think he ended up playing maybe like 30 seconds out of the last 10 minutes of, of gameplay. Uh, I forget where I saw this, but there, there's something out there where his skill set at the time did not match up with what his team needed. And it was nothing personal, but he wasn't going to be seeing the ice there. If uh, if I remember right, he wasn't on the ice the last shift of their uh, cup clincher. A, uh, it may have had to do with him taking, you know, minute and a half shift shortly before. But uh, also, I mean, I, I love Ovi as much as anyone. He's one of the best scorers of all time. Not necessarily the most complete defensive player. So uh, when, when you're protecting that one goal lead at the end, I mean, he can, he can train through someone and throw him through the glass. But, you know, D in front of the net, he might not be who you want when you're trying to, trying to clinch the cup winner. Well, I think uh, a few times uh, videos have come out of like, is it a broken controller or is it an Ovechkin back check? Where he's just got his hands <laughs> on his hips and he's just gliding back watching the play happen. Uh, it's, it's not the video game where the controller disconnected. It was actually a real life situation and you're scratching your head. And, uh, it makes a lot more sense of, of how a coach manages a bench and, and how you get that ice time. So uh, he's going to probably break the all-time goal scoring record, but still – there are moments in a game where he's just not going to see the ice. So it just goes to show, uh, even if you're the best offensive player, or the best goal scorer in the game, there, there are moments where if you can't do what is, you know, what the job requires, you're just not going to get put out for that job. And effectively, as you and I know, coaches, you know, ice time is trust. You know, can we trust you to do what we expect you to do? Do we expect you to generate offense? Do we expect you to shut down? Uh, you know, what is that expectation, you know, and how do you as a coach manage that expectation with your players? Uh, are you doing it up front? Um, you know, how do you have those conversations? Cause they're not always fun. 
Uh, it's definitely definitely not always fun to to you know, particularly a, with a, a a senior or a captain who you know you've they've garnered that trust, and then suddenly you're seeing bad habits, or you're seeing you're seeing those those sort of undesirables, maybe out of frustration, and having to have that conversation. I, I, trust me, I didn't think when we were going to get on this call, I'd be picking apart Ovechkin's game or or talking about things about Patrick Line that frustrate me. But uh, you know, I, I watch every Jackets game, and it uh, it, it definitely bugs me to see at times. Uh, Line a try to take the puck wider on a defenseman or go through a defenseman, lose the puck, and instead of a, a stop and start, it's a, a curl back. I lost it. I'm not going for it. And that's, you know, that's a hard conversation to have with maybe your best player, you know, at the high school ranks to say, hey, you're, you know, you're, you're not doing everything we're asking for and setting a pretty rough example for the younger guys. I, I gotta, I gotta have you sit and watch uh, a younger kid show, you know, show that he wants it more. That can be a tough conversation to have uh, at the youth level. Uh, you know, sometimes you know that that conversation is going to result in a phone call with an angry parent later that day. You know, remember the Titans ask, "My kid's the best you've got. Why are you benching my kid?" You know, it's it's tough when that message may not be consistent from the coach to to the, you know, what the, what the, the parents are telling the kid later, but you know, you got 20 kids, you don't just have one or two. So that, that's a conversation that has to happen. Yeah. And I know when I have these types of conversations, like, you know, I, I can give you what you want, but is that fair for everyone else? You know, is giving one kid worth having the other 19 really upset? You know, like, at what point do you put the player over the team? Like, there are situations where you stick up for a player and you try to uh, grow them as a person uh, as well, and there are times for that. But a lot of times it's just understanding the importance of everyone else uh, in the group and, and seeing a bigger picture than yourself. That's 100%, you know, aligns with the experiences that I've had. Um, I, I know we're going to talk about this a little bit more later when we dive into the speci you know the specifics of the experience I had uh, last year, but man, that was an even tougher conversation to have with kids, particularly seniors during the the uh, last year's COVID impacted season, where uh, so you know sometimes they weren't at school, they weren't getting to see their friends or their girlfriend, they weren't getting to go out and have fun like you would as a, you know a senior in high school, and then they come to to hockey, you know a, a you know, something that that's supposed to kind of provide that that time away from kind of real life, essentially, and then getting talked to by the coach about how they're they're not doing everything that's expected. I mean, that's it was kind of tough to put additional things on you know the negative side into the mind of of a young person. Really took a lot of focus on my part of making sure that I wasn't coming across in like a personal attack. Like separating the separating the the bad habit or bad tendency or, or something that I wasn't seeing from the player from the kid. I, I remind myself that all the time. That I mean, it, an eighteen year old is is a, a very young person. Uh, you know, I, I try to think back. How well did I take criticism, even constructive criticism, as an eighteen year old? And then I think, all right, and you know, 18 year old Mike, you haven't seen your friends and gone to school in six months. So I, it, those were, those were tough conversations to have during really tough times when sometimes I felt like the kids needed kind of a, 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 a mentor or even someone to talk to even more than a hockey coach. And that, that's a key thing you just brought up the, the separation between the player and the person, you know, I, maybe there's some coaches that are not this way, but I've never met them, but, you know, all the coaches want the best for the players. Um, you want the best for your kids. I want the best for mine. And it's a matter of how do we do that? And it's not always, you know, sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> Sometimes it's those hard conversations that help them grow. Um, and you, you had a really nice player uh, that had a, some good leadership. And I'd love to hear maybe some examples of that leadership uh, that played for you at the high school level last year. 
um, is now at the University of Akron with the uh, the Sips Hockey Club. So uh, maybe give us some examples of, of what that good leadership happens to look like, um, because you know there is that separation between player and person, and growing that person usually leads in growing that player as a leader and as a team member as well, and it's oh so important. The uh, the two things that I think I would speak to the most about that player, um, besides being a, a fantastic hockey player, and like we've talked about, that's not necessarily enough to be a leader. You can't just be the you know maybe the best player on the team. Every single practice uh, to to this young man looked like Game Seven of the Stanley Cup Finals. Wanted to win every drill. Wanted to. I mean. It, seem to really analyze why a shot didn't hit the net or why they, you know, why he got poked, uh, you know, in a, in a one-on-one or a three-on-two drill. Um, it, you, you could really see a, a, a competitive edge that not everybody has, you know, at that age. Um, in terms of, you know, game days, I mean, I, I can I can vividly remember several situations of, uh, this this player talking to the team and saying, first things first, I need to give more. I didn't do what I needed to do, and and that didn't set a good example. And and maybe that that let the rest of us think that we only need to push as hard as I'm pushing. And if that's the case, I need to push more. That has been rare to me. You know, almost a, a decade of of being involved in coaching hockey. That's that's rare for a young person to call themselves out in front of their teammates, in front of their peers. But I mean, these, these sort of things, I, I can tell you this player did not play for, for uh, my high school, fresh, their freshman and sophomore year, came in their junior year and the captain, like the leadership team of captains came to me, you know, halfway through that year and said, Hey, even though this kid hasn't been with us the last two years, um, we need him as a captain with us. Again, a rare thing for, you know, a couple young guys to say, it shouldn't be all about us. We need, and the team needs him as well, and and that uh, that spoke volumes. Extremely rare to call yourself out, but it, it's such a humbling experience. And think what that does to the other people in the room, right? Like especially young folk. You know, they they're most most of them are trying to just survive out there. Um, you know get to the point where you're able to think beyond yourself um, and raise those expectations for others to look inward and reflect and continue to grow. I think that's extremely powerful. So I would would like to put a cap on this for a little bit and and get to your experience uh, when when there was a coaching need that was there to be filled um, and you stepped into it, uh, maybe reluctantly at first, uh, but you probably grew a great appreciation for this team. Um, and I'll let you explain the situation uh, in your own words. And it was your experience. I know you and I had, had quite a few phone calls about it, but I think it's such an enlightening conversation because this was uh, maybe not the AAA level and we're trying to you know go to the next level and continually you know pushing, but more of seeing that there's more than just the high level hockey. There's also maybe some lower level hockey um, and the great fun and development personally um, and as a player and the confidence that can be grown from from those types of situations. So I'll, uh, I'll let you take it from there. Well, yeah, I, I, it, it's funny you use the word reluctantly because I, 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 it wasn't exactly a reluctant situation to become involved, but I, I, I heard about a need uh, for, for help with one of the, the Bantam teams, and uh, I, I agreed to, to come help out. And I showed up to, uh, you know, an early practice and was handed a clipboard and said, thank you so much for taking over as head coach of this team with a roster and a schedule and everything. And uh, I was there in front of a whole bunch of kids and parents and just sort of happened. Um, But uh, really good group of kids, but a very unique situation. Um, The top three or so players on this team. I think the team had 16, 16 kids. The top three in terms of skill level. Um, I mean, I, I know one's a, a starting goalie for a high school team right now as a freshman. Um, the other two are, are go, I, I, I could see them both being 
high level contributors and leaders on their teams starting as you know starting their freshman years as you kind of got down the level of skill development there were several very new skaters um several bantams who i don't think it ever considered the fact that they were going to start dealing with checking and what that would entail and what i found out to also be several players who were playing because their parents had told them they they had to do something and they hadn't been uh, engaging in a lot of social activity or they only had one sort of thing they liked to do and their parents kind of made them reach out more to, to figure out something else in terms of a social activity and somehow ended up in full contact hockey, uh, maybe a bit reluctantly. So uh, definitely a bit of a challenge because, you know, at the high school level, it, you sort of stop seeing, it's kind of like little league baseball sort of thins out as you get towards high school in terms of kids who don't want to be there or who may not love what you're doing. You, you really kind of have to love going to the rink at all hours of the night and driving through the cold and, getting hurt and getting hit and wearing two thousand dollars of armor while you're doing it but this was a unique situation because there were several kids who needed that kind of higher level development several who needed really early development skills and a couple others who for them and again it was during that covid period of time who needed fun in their life and needed this activity to be an escape from everything else that may have been going on so it was a it was a it was like coaching three or four teams at once um there were there were a couple of uh, great uh, dads of players who who I was coaching with who had experience with hockey and and uh, a couple of uh, one of them had had experience working with young people, but that was a shock at the beginning. Uh, and I know I called you a couple times and said, "There's not a lot of hockey going on. It's a lot of kind of social emotional development that we're we're working on." Uh, and that was that was difficult. Uh, while I was also coaching a high school team at the same time, uh, to go to one practice and and really be going after it, and another practice. And kind of at times talking about what mindset and kind of mental space kids were coming to practice within, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And one of the early conversations that you and I had was your struggle to handle the fact that players were scared of contact. Like they were basically passing the puck to the opponents. Oh, so yeah. They didn't get hit. Um, and I know you also came – Let's we'll attack, attack that at one point, but maybe come with what your original mindset was going into it, and then maybe a few weeks later, a month or two later, you know, how did your mindset evolve throughout the season? Uh, again, coaching like two, three teams, having players that are scared to get hit, maybe they're just out there, and this might be their last year of hockey. Well, I can tell you that at the beginning of that that Bantam season, it was pretty difficult for me to kind of extrapolate what are we doing besides trying to develop our hockey, like our, our hockey skills specifically in our development. You know, I, I think my mindset kind of at the beginning was if you're here, you're here to play hockey and, and I'm going to work with you to try to help you become a better hockey player relatively quickly realized through conversations with with you and conversations with with other coaches that have, have been mentors to me in the past I, you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink kind of thing where if you don't have it in you to seek out the puck and seek out contact and you're not thrilled about what it is that you're doing in the first place striving towards that hockey development as the ultimate goal may not be realistic um, for some of the players. That's not to say, you know, half the teams working on high level development drills on one end of the ice and, you know, the other, the other group are playing, you know, playing tag or sharks and minnows on the other side, just happy to be there. Um, but the ultimate goal may have been slightly different. I, I, I do know that there are several players 
who, um, you know, who that was, um, not several, there were a couple of players who that did end up being um, the last year of hockey they played. I know one was a, a competitive gymnast. Another was, interestingly enough, a very successful competitive uh, online gamer. And, you know, that's really where the passion fell. And, I mean, if you're going to do something for for hours and hours a week, you got to love it. You got to, you know, with hockey, you got to love contact. You got to love cold. You got to love, you know, intensity. And it's 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 hard to not have a love for kind of all those aspects. But the the man, the one that really shook me was the. Uh, I, I kind of was left speechless seeing a couple kids take a puck, usually in in the neutral zone see someone from the other team coming and pass the puck to a player on the other team and then start skating backwards, like preparing themselves to play defense. It, it, that's a, that's a, an odd thing to see and then try to think about from a hockey perspective. Like we're not even really approaching hockey skill and development at that point. That's, that's sort of a mental block that we need to, we need to discuss and need to kind of game plan for. I, I'd assume that's not something you've seen much at uh, with with uh, you know Great Lakes hockey, Great Lakes Division hockey, or uh, ACHA hockey from your end. Not particularly. Um, I, I mean, public schools and private schools, uh, depending on on where they are in the, in uh, the pyramid, are, are definitely uh, night and day different on the types of. <laughs> conversations and the types of situations that you're handling you know a, a lot of my conversations were around higher level of thinking I mean that's part of the podcast and the newsletter um, but I've had plenty of people on where I think there's value in understanding the whole gamut of the types of players you're coming across because while the hockey may be different the motivations may be different the people are the same, you know, like there's, there's the humanity in us all that you can never get away from. Um, but like, that's definitely a tough one. And I know that that was definitely an interesting conversation that you and I had on the phone as you were basically beside yourself, like how can a player possibly put a tape to tape pass and then just start skating backwards at, on defense? Like, how is that going through their head as the best play? I mean, it, it's it's pretty obvious to see when strategy leaves the mind quickly and fight or flight kicks in, and and in that case, much, much stronger on the flight. Um, but uh, one of the ways that that I really attack that, and I'm I'm a pretty active coach when I'm when I'm on the ice in practice. A lot of times, I'm I'm pretty involved in drills or pretty involved you know, in, in the drill myself to be able to see, you know, if I want to see how, how uh, forwards attack defensemen, I'm going to dive in as a defenseman and see kind of what that looks like. But um, I mean, we started with it, going back, you know, kind of old school, proper checking technique, proper technique for taking a hit and then work towards angling, you know, angling, showing that, the purpose of a hit isn't necessarily to remove a guy from his consciousness or remove him from his head. It's to remove the puck. You know, a, 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 a gentle hip check is you get in front of someone and stick tap them and remove the puck from them accomplishes what you're trying to accomplish without, you know, putting lives in danger, I guess. Um, but we, we started there. And one of the ways that I, I kind of tried to show, not just, you know, coach it, but show it. Um, I was out there in full gear. If you're not going to hit each other, hit me. I'll show you that, you know, coach T, you know, five, five coach T with a bad hip out in full gear, you know, the gear protects you. And if you don't duck and you don't turn your back and you, you know, you're prepared and with a wide base to brace for a hit, that's when you're safest and trying to, you know, kind of start from there you know, I, I think that got a lot of the a lot of the kids on the team kind of thinking. Guys are coming at me to try to take the puck, not to hurt me or kill me. 
and now I'm prepared for what that looks like. Um, and we, we started to see it slowly, but we started to see, you know, while, while not everyone was seeking out contact or trying to throw hits or trying to dive into corners and really initiate the contact, there wasn't so much a fear for it. It was, it was sort of a, a, you know, ancillary part of the game, not, you know, an all mind consuming. Am I going to get hit when I'm out there? Am I going to get hit when I'm out there? There's nothing like the coach being in full pads. <laughs> I usually uh, do that for the last practice of the year. I'll, I'll let the kids, uh, you know, have a run at Coach Revac a little bit. Yeah, that, that's fun for them. So as soon as you put those pads on, players usually want to hit the coach a little bit, you know, give, give a little bit and have a, have a little bit of fun there. So I, I think that's, that's awesome. So I'm curious, continuing on with that season, you know, what did the end, you know, obviously where you started was, was a tough place, but where did you end the season? You know, where was – the team at i'm assuming it was a much better spot than than when you know you started with it yeah so uh during the um the kind of scrimmage and the you know preseason where you, you figure out what division you're going to be at and what level you're going to be at um won a couple lost a couple and then something kind of uh, 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 there was a kind of a flick of the switch i think a, 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 a we had to travel to a game and we scored the first goal or two, and then one of our kind of higher level kids got yard sailed like real quick into the game, two minutes, three minutes in. And there was like a flick of a switch where the entire team kind of lost their aggressive, you know, their, their aggression their, to get to the puck and to move the puck. And it was just kind of protect myself. And it took a while to, to get through that for a good chunk of the team and it, it made for some rough hockey. There were, there were, there were some games of not, not having much puck possession because the goal was get rid of the puck and be away from the puck. But as it, that was sort of the roadblock, as we were able to get more comfortable with the concept of contact, our possession, you know, our time of possession Based on the eye test, I mean, we're, we're, there's there's no one keeping that stat necessarily in Bantam hockey, but the um, you know the eye test of are we possessing the puck, are we attempting to break out a a, a clear breakout with a purpose, not you know a, a Murph dump just to to try to avoid a hit, um, and we started to score goals and we started to win some games. Um, I, I think down the down the stretch in the last the last you know, four games, I think we were, it was, you know, it was win, loss, win, loss, or, or maybe the opposite loss, win, loss, win. And we finished on a win um, and, you know, hadn't, hadn't won too many, you know, in a chunk of time. So it, it, you could, you could kind of see confidence start to build when results started to show, not just of, of winning games, but of, you know, well, I'm, 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 you know, little Tommy and, when I when I you know occupy space in the slot, that's where the puck ends up, and you know I have the puck on my stick and I have an opportunity to score, or I score a goal, or you know someone someone tries to line me up, and I get that wide stance and brace for the contact, and they bounce off or they hit the ice and I don't. I mean you you. You don't necessarily always want to see smiles on the ice during gameplay, but I'd, I'd start to see them of, hey, look what I did. And that was, I mean, I keep going back to it, but I mean, when, you know, when, when, when with, with some kids that really needed a win during a really tough time of their childhood, or, you know, their, their kind of young adulthood, uh, seeing it click for some of them was I mean, a, a real eye opener for me and kind of another angle at which to through which to analyze, you know, am I successful in my coaching? Yeah, I think that personally is is massive. Like, am I leaving this team, these players, these people in a better spot than when I found them? Like that's the ultimate like, the wins and losses, that's great. And that's like the byproduct. 
But what really matters is exactly what you talked about is that process and seeing that confidence grow and giving them the tools, whether it be going from out of the lineup to in the lineup or bottom of the lineup to middle of the lineup and then from middle to top or even just those top players, you know, like they're competing against the best players on the other team. Like they're competing to be the best player on the ice bar none. So just taking the team, the players to that next level, and especially the people and giving them that confidence to go do stuff is just amazing. And I think you did a wonderful job with it. And it probably has a little bit to, to do with how you approach that situation as, as a teacher um, going through those metal blocks, not working around it per se, but facing that, you know, that's something that anyone can take is facing that head on, figuring out how to get comfortable, go through with that, and then press forward with a smile on your face. Well, the, the tough part of that can be, I, you know, I may have a smile on my face and a d- young developing player who's starting to see some successes may have a smile on their face. But an aspect that um, really proved to be challenging, but I, I was able to kind of get better in tune with as the season went on, there's some pretty high, I mean, at the top of that team, there were some pretty high level players. Um, and they at times were bored and frustrated and disengaged. I mean, I, I try to put myself in, in the shoes of maybe the, the kind of top point producer and kind of top skill guy on my team. I'm out here really trying to bust it the whole game and a kid on my line just passed the puck to the other team so he wouldn't get hit. You know, what? like what, this, this isn't the hockey I want to be playing. Or, you know, in practice, I really hope I'm going to be challenged. Like, there's not anyone else out here to challenge me. So at times, I mean, the creativity from the coaching staff actually had to, at times, include some of these higher-level players competing with the coaches or really competing with each other. Because it's it's hard... I mean, if, if there's a team of 20 and 10 are at that high level and 10 are kind of in the more development level, you know, you can you can make five on five in, in intense skill development. You can make that work, but it's really hard to make two on two or two on one skill development, you know, a, a, a reality for an entire practice or an entire season. So it, it definitely took some creativity on our part to try to ask some of these higher level kids I, I really need your leadership to to make this work. That's a lot to ask of a thir- you know a thirteen or fourteen year old kid. I I need your help in showing what a hockey player looks like and how a hockey player practices. Well, think about. I think that's that's actually super powerful when when I think about it because you're now asking someone to give back. Yeah. Best part about writing a newsletter is understanding like maybe I don't understand it as good as I thought I did in my head. Like it sounds really good in my head and sounds really good when I talk, but then when I put it on paper, kind of an issue. And just having that ability to give back and think about how do I teach this to someone else or how do I show the way, whether that be with your high school and, and how that kid was calling out himself versus a kid trying to show the way to uh, the players that that struggle a little bit more. Like that's super powerful learning experience for them and actually helps them grow because now they understand these things better. I, I think what you went through was probably learning in dog years compared to most coaches that have an easier ride or have all the players that are very similar. I, I think that it's super valuable for coaches to get that experience where you've got a wide range. How do you engage that top kid? How do you engage that bottom kid? And what do you need to do? Do you need to handicap practices? Do you need to get coaches and extra coaches involved? Like, I think it's just a fascinating case study. And I'm curious to maybe uh, start to wrap this up a little bit. Just, you know, what did you learn throughout that year that you can pass along to other coaches or you can pass along to players that are listening to this podcast? I think number one, as cliche as this might sound, it's got to be fun. Top to bottom, if you're not having fun, it's hard to to get up early and come to morning practice or stay late for a late practice. You got to keep the fun. Um, And 
a lot of that is, you know, like we talked about earlier, calling out the behavior while, you know, still humanizing the kid and separating the kid from the behavior, the kid from the the bad habit or tendency. And just just reminding yourself that fun needs to be a part of it. Um, and not reminding the players that fun needs to be a part of it, reminding yourself as a coach, part of why I am here is, I mean, it, I don't know that Elaine Vigneault's behind the bench going, hey guys, you guys having fun? But, uh, you know, that for us, we need to be doing that. Um, Number two, and this is this is a big one for me, whether it's in teaching or coaching or business or up to whoever the president of the United States happens to be. Talk to people who are smarter than you. Surround yourself by really smart people and listen to the what you know, listen to what they have to say. I reached out. I mean, how many phone calls did you and I have? How many phone calls did I have with with uh you know, some coaches in their 40s, 50s, 60s who have been doing it for way longer than me and have more experience and hockey knowledge than me. And and never for a second did I say, oh, I, I got it. I know all there is to know and I can I can handle this without any help or any any uh you know any any input from others. I mean constantly reassess and, and reflect and just talk to people talk to people who know. I mean, you, you do your uh, kind of the last thing I'll say about it that's sort of, you know, with with a smile, you know, we we do a, uh, a, a you know, a USA hockey clinic or, you know, coaching coaching clinic and modules and all that every year. And I mean, I, I, at one point, you know, I thought about I, I got to reach out to some of these guys, these USA hockey guys who have been doing this for 40 years and are are looking to give back and looking to to share experience, you know, I mean, I, I remember reaching out to, uh, to, to, uh, was it coach Z at Kent state? And, uh, I met him through a USA hockey clinic. I mean, just, just looking out for the, the, the coaching resources and the coaching community that we have around us. Absolutely. And I think the word that you use that most encapsulates the, maximum amount of growth that you can have, whether it be a parent, player, person, coach, et cetera, is reflect. You know, we're constantly assessing and reflecting. You know, that's where the growth really happens. When you start thinking too fast and you're just going out and doing it and going through the motions and you're not truly reflecting, you're you're stunting growth. And that reflection is just the most important piece out of everything. Um, and something with USA hockey, if, if you go through the modules nowadays, at the end of every single section is the word reflection. And then it's got two or three questions that you need to ask yourself and come up with answers for. That's where the growth happens. I, so I think that's the most important. Some people, uh, as journaling, some people just like to think about it, uh, but having that element, that time to slow down, to think, reflect, um, that's, that's absolutely massive. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's that kind of internal fight between, uh, you know, ego and and reflection. I mean, thinking from the perspective of you know, I'm coaching young people, putting myself in the in the place of a young person. How would a young person, you know, maybe 14 or 15, reflect to what I just said or how I just explained something or, you know. Did I did I let my my coach ego, you know, or you know, did I use a bad? Did I, in trying to address a player's poor attitude, did I, uh, you know, mirror a poor attitude? Uh, those are some things that you know, working with with thirteen year olds, thirteen year olds can really get under your skin, and they they know how to do it, and they seem sometimes to have fun doing it. So did I just, you know, did I just model poor attitude in trying to address my, my, uh, you know, players' poor attitude? I mean, just re- reflection from 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 all angles. Absolutely. 
Well, uh, Mike, I want to thank you for taking the time and coming on. Uh, before we go, uh, I'll let you have the floor for anything. Uh, talk about anything, maybe your, your love for the jackets, or heck, you can even ask me a question if you want. Tur turn the podcast on itself, whatever you want. Tell me when the, you know, tell me if this is the year for the Leafs. I, I, I love the jackets. I love talking about them, but I, it's, I, I, I love talking to my, my coach and hockey, you know, coach friends and hockey friends who are really into the Leafs. And it seems every year I get to watch them play as deep into the first round as they feel like, um, is this the year? So uh, my philosophy on this is that you want to keep your window open as long as possible uh, to win that cup because a lot of it is just luck. Um, that's one of the things with hockey. There's, there's a lot of things that could potentially happen and go sideways on you, uh, especially at the NHL when you've got uh, every player on every team can make you pay in some capacity. So I am happy with where the Leafs are. Uh, yes, they haven't got out of the second round in a bit, but I think that they are continually growing, um, especially if you check out the Austin Matthews piece I did on his defensive development with the Hockey IQ newsletter. Uh, I think you can see how they're progressing. Um, maybe it's not as fast as people want it to be, but uh, it's definitely happening. And you're seeing guys in their prime being surrounded by good people and you're continually growing. And it was about time that the Leafs uh, – Use their financial might the best to the best of their ability and having so many great coaches and so many great uh, managers of talent and just uh, good quality people. Finally, in that organization, after so many years uh, behind the salary cap, can't spend it on the players, uh, might as well spend it on everything that supports those players. So uh, I don't I'm not going to claim that this is the year or any year is the year. Um, I'll continue to enjoy watching them play. But uh, I think that keeping that window open as long as possible, reinforcing the talent when you can uh, for reasonable uh, prices um, will, will eventually lead to, to good results. And obviously the cup is where we all want to be and, and have. But uh, again, there's a lot of luck that goes into that. And sometimes it goes your way and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, look at Montreal. They were at the cup finals last year. and uh, The roster's relatively the same. And it's just not going as well. I mean, yes, they, they lost Carey Price and uh, Dano, but still you shouldn't go from Stanley Cup finalist all the way to last place team or second last place team in the NHL uh, that quickly. So I'll put it out there. I don't know what, who, whose year it is, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of good teams out there, a lot of good hockey. I like the parody in the NHL. It's, it's fun every night. Anyone can beat anyone. Yeah, you. Uh, I I don't know who could have predicted uh, such a, a rough start for the Habs. I, I know I sure didn't. Um, yeah, and I, I guess the only uh, the only other thing that I would ask, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll close this up here. How do you explain a uh, a, a whole bunch of uh, eighteen, nineteen year olds uh, in Columbus uh, coming together like they are? Uh, some, you know, some older guys like a Boone Jenner on pace to have the best season he's ever had in his 12th year. How do you, how do you explain a team, you know, expected to be at the bottom getting wins that they maybe shouldn't get? Where does that come from? Uh, it's like that teacher that you don't like. and They suddenly go away and you just want to prove that, you know, it wasn't all them. It's kind of like uh, Bill Walsh. So the, the older people want, will get this one, but maybe not the younger crowd. But uh, he was the 49ers coach for a long time and quite the perfectionist and intense person um, and won the Super Bowl, retired out on top. And I think it was the next season they ended up going back to back. And if you always hear the, you, you hear the interviews of the ex-players, like we wanted to prove that we could do it without him. We were, that was the most motivated year of our careers. Um, and I think that was the same for Vegas uh, when they went through the expansion process. Um, hadn't happened in a while. Players didn't know what to expect other than, you know, we, we don't want you as bad as you want other guys. And, and they took that personal. I think maybe the Seattle wasn't um, as dramatic as, as people saw the success and that, you know, this might be good for me rather than being really upset. Um, so I, I think that 
getting out from under torts. I think torts developed the talent really well, um, allowed a few guys to, to blossom uh, and maybe do it to, to show that they could do it without him. That, that would be my one theory. Uh, I have two more that go with it, but I think that that would be the big one for, for today. Yeah, especially when we're talking about uh, youth hockey. It, I, I, there, there are some coaching, uh, coaching philosophies that, that could be real effective at the youth level. I don't know that uh, – I don't know how, how well torts would do in Bantam. Um, not not yeah. so good, but he he's changed. Um, I will I will say that I was wrong on his hire into Columbus. I thought it was going to be a, um, a year and a half, and they would be on their merry way. But um, he wasn't the same coach he was elsewhere. So he he definitely cool. brought the humanity um, with him after the last firing that he didn't have in the prior spots. Uh, he was a little more soft. Uh, handled situations. I mean, you still got to be true to yourself, but uh, I think the fact that he related the players more, I don't know if maybe it was his kids were getting up in that, that age group as well. He could truly understand and relate to the players, um, but he wasn't the hard person to play for where he had uh, the city and brothers blocking shots in Vancouver. You know, he, he wasn't going to go that crazy. Oof. Yeah. Not, uh, not trying to, you know, start your checking line and then go into the other team's locker room in between periods. He, 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 he did get a little softer. It was, it was, it was, it was fun to, fun to see that growth. And we'll, we'll see if that continues with, uh, with, with Brad Larson in, in his first season. That's fun to watch from my end, but uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of fun. And I just want to thank you for having me on. It was uh, good to get to talk some hockey with you. Absolutely, Mike. Thanks for coming on. It was, it was a lot of good stories, a lot of good life lessons along the way. So really happy you're able to come on. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I know I did. So before we let you go, though, we'd like to remind you to please like our podcast, subscribe to it, give us a follow uh, and share this with all the hockey people in your life. We really appreciate uh, growing this community, this podcast. Um, remember, we also have a newsletter, the Hockey IQ newsletter as well. Really excited to continue to grow this. So please help us grow this further by liking, subscribing, following, and sharing uh, with everyone. So appreciate you all. Take care.